our foster care system is shattered. And this podcast is about how we as a community can come together to bring about change, change in the system and changing the lives of children in foster care. Hi, my name is Rob Shear. I'm the founder of a national charity called Comfort Cases. I'm an advocate for children in foster care. I'm a public speaker. I'm an author of a forever family, but most important, I'm a dad to five of the most amazing kids. Welcome to the Fostering Change podcast. Well, here we are, another Tuesday with Fostering Change. You know, we are ending our season um, a lot sooner than, you know, I actually thought it's been flying by. But I will tell you that this season has brought so much education to me. And I think that that's important. And I hope each and every one of you that have been listening or viewing on our YouTube channel that you've been educated as well. And I think that's one thing that I've always wanted to get out of this podcast is to make sure that we're educated. My next guest, I'm very, very lucky. So not only am I lucky enough to say that, you know, she is in our center volunteering all the time. She actually has helped develop several of our programs that we actually use at Comfort Cases, but she's also getting ready to be one of my newest board members. So I'm so happy to announce Dr. Susie Friedman. Susie, welcome to Fostering Change. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Rob. You know, Susie, when I first met you, first of all, didn't know that you were a doctor um, and you um, came across, as your shirt said, as a good human. And you actually came to me and started talking about trauma. Um, And, you know, I have I've actually have spoken a couple of times at the University of Maryland where you actually teach. Um, And, you know, I also started doing a lot of research in reference to trauma that is based on children who enter foster care. And so before we get started, I want you to correct me on some things if I'm incorrect about this. I've read just recently that there are studies that are going on and that things that we did not realize about how trauma is infected even in utero Mm -hmm. and that children who come into our foster care system that we have to start thinking about whether if they came in at one or they came in at 12 what is that cycle started even in utero have you been reading about that well i have not read very much about trauma in utero but um but i read a lot about um, trauma in general and the way that trauma can affect Um, our nervous system, regardless of age, but how it can really almost imprint on our nervous system when um, children are very small. Um, And and so, but I think first, if I may, I'd like to distinguish between stress and trauma, because trauma is a word that um, is used a lot, um, you know, in conversations, um, and and sometimes I think people might need stress. Um, So stress is um, anything that we encounter where we have to pull on our coping strategies, but it's something that we can manage. Um, so if, and sometimes stress can even be helpful. So if we have a looming deadline, a paper due or an exam to study for, we might feel um, extra stress or we might feel preoccupied, but we can handle those things. Um, and trauma, I'm sorry. No, no, I was gonna say, cause I, I, I'll be, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I wanna talk about this a little deeper because that's something that I have seen quite often, especially in the in the last, you know, how many months we've all been going through the pandemic is that stress, trauma, stress, trauma. And and again, I, I know I'm going to get the emails. I know I'm going to get uh, get everything on my social media platform. It's OK. I got tough skin. I think that the word trauma has been used quite often when I feel like we need to start talking about stress. Maybe sometimes, you know, um, and I think those stress and trauma, it's also very individualized. And the way that I think it's, it's useful to think about is that if we experience an experience or a set of experiences that over, overwhelms our ability to cope, we can feel overwhelmed, but still be able to manage things. Um, well, using our coping strategies, reaching out to friends, um, using 
things like mindfulness or journaling or exercise, um, healthy ways of managing stress. Um, and then we're kind of in the stress category. With trauma, however, the system is overwhelmed, the system being the human, um, where the coping strategies and the skills that we have are just not enough. And so you can imagine a child who's living in a home uh, where that is characterized by chaos, who has not yet had the skills, they're the time to develop the skills necessary to manage what's going on, might feel physically really overwhelmed. Um, because they don't have anything to draw from in that in that regard. So so then, so my question then would be when it comes to the level of the trauma, okay? So, I, and I'm just going to give an example. Um, a, a child has trauma at the age of one and two, major trauma, let's yeah. say. And they don't actually work through that trauma or that trauma doesn't start to show until they're in their teen years. Is that something that's not uncommon? Well, I think it might show itself in different ways, you know, throughout the throughout the child's life. You know, if a child encounters something traumatic in children at age one and two, they, you know, what do children need? They need stability and predictability. They need comforting and soothing. They need to um, know even at that early age that someone is going to be there for them and be responsive. And so through that attachment, they learn that they themselves are lovable and they learn that the world is um, safe and predictable and that the, and others, the caregivers are um, consistent and reliable and also loving. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that attachment, if that, if something, and, something goes awry in that early attachment experience for whatever reason, that is a trauma that can imprint on a child. And then it may be very difficult for the child to, you know, learn how to manage their feelings um, because there's no reliable, consistent adult that's helping them learn that skill. They may not understand that other people are trustworthy. Um, and even in the face of seeing kindness, um, and responsiveness from, from adults later on may not feel on a very physical, visceral level that they can trust that. This is the kind of trauma, you know? Yeah, and I see so many kids within our system, yeah. you know, who are dealing with that. Kids who are dealing with reactive attachment disorder, yeah. um, kids who deal with defiant disorder mm -hmm. and all of these disorders. But if you go and you link back, um, to what they went through as a child, you can understand why they're acting out as 15 or 13 or even 10, um, because they never had that attachment or they never had what I consider that, that solid foundation during those such critical, critical years. Exactly. You know, in the attachment literature, they call that the secure base and that, you know, the parent, the caregiver, you know, whoever they are, uh, provides that secure base so the child can, again, know that they are lovable and worthy um, and also feel confident to go out and explore the world. And when that doesn't happen for a child, you know, and the good news is we don't have to be perfect in terms of providing that attachment. We have to be just good enough. Um, and but when the child is really, really missing those important early attachment experiences that that let them learn things about themselves right it's a it's a lens that they have about themselves others in the world then they they may feel and sense danger um in places where danger may not really really exist sometimes danger might exist there but it might be very difficult that for them to trust someone um, and it might be then also very difficult for them to to understand different feelings that they're having and there may be um, sadness or anxiety or anger, rage, um, that might feel also very frightening to them. Yeah, you know, Susie, I, I will tell you, I, I say this quite often when it comes to our system. Our system is shattered and we are not giving enough to our children for their mental health. Um, and, and 
things that I'm reading now, and you know, by the way, all of our listeners, our viewers, they know I'm very an open book. I have a son who suffers from RAD, which is reactive attachment disorder. People say to me all the time, oh my gosh, you gave him so much. You loved him so much. How could he now have RAD? Um, well, you know, the fact is, is that no matter how much you love or give, when a child is wired that particular way, that's the way they happen to be wired. And my thing is, is that I feel like if we would do a better job with our mental health, with our children who enter our system, maybe we wouldn't have the outcomes that we have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it's helpful to think in the system, but also in, in schools, you know, and if there's a child that um, is, you know, acting out um, maybe in different ways that feels destructive to the teacher um, for, for the perspective to really be, you know, um, I wonder what happens to this child, not what is wrong with this child. Um, because then the, right, then I didn't make that up, right? That's the trauma. Informed but I've never heard, by the way, I, I've had literally hundreds of guests on, doctors as well, and I've never heard anyone say that to me. Um, until just recently, when I had Dr. Perry on, um, who wrote the book with Oprah, and he said, I wonder what happened to yeah. that child and not why and you just said that so i i think we need that more in our vocabulary i think that we need more teaching with our teachers i think we need more teachings with our social workers i think we need more teaching within our own community of not that a child is bad because i don't believe in a child being bad i believe it's a child that needs to be redirected or a child that we need to help to figure out what happened to that child yeah, and it's a it's a paradigm shift, isn't it? Um, and I see more and more people in schools and and providers kind of making that shift now. So I, I I feel I hope that we're moving you know in the right direction. But I also think that you know we none of us come to the table with that kind of wiring, right? That's something that is learned or intuited um, by the exchanges between an infant a child and a caregiver. Um, and so um, that's the good news in that it, it, it can, we can rewire, um, but, it, but like you said, it requires a shift in perspective and a shift in intervention. But I think one of the, one of the things that I really like so much about working with trauma and complex trauma is that it is, um, it's not a foregone conclusion. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. You know, you've helped us in so many ways here at Comfort Cases. You know, so many things that you've done, including um, help us with an entire program where we're teaching empathy um, within our classroom. And, you know, and one thing I want to talk to you about before we take a quick break is triggers. You know, um, you know, I, I've heard this quite often. I was just reading something just recently, uh, you know, that that people are seeing these triggers more. Can you explain to me exactly what that is when it comes to, a, you know, therapeutic part of what what is this trigger? Yeah. So a trigger is or is just a reminder for someone um, of something that happened in the, in the past that may still feel really active or unresolved for them. And so um, if, a, if a, you know, a child is in a classroom and um, the teacher redirects them, it might trigger a feeling of being criticized. Even if the teacher is kind and empathic in, in her or his delivery, you know? Um, but a child, if it's a reminder of something that um, from the past, you know, sort of inherent in the definition of trigger is that the reaction in the situation um, is perhaps too strong, the charge is too high. Um, and so part of the reaction belongs elsewhere. And again, that's kind of a clue then, right? That something happened to the child, there's something more to understand. And so, so what truly happens then in our nervous system when we experience trauma that would make that trigger? Yeah, so one of the things, again, that distinguishes stress from trauma is that when we have a trauma reaction, um, our, there's something in our nervous system that reacts. Usually, 
um, the part of our brain that's in charge of thinking and planning and sort of ration, rational thought um, works in conjunction with the emotion part of our brain. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, we have an experience and we think about it and we may have a reaction to it, maybe anger, maybe happiness. And then we, we put meaning to it from other experiences we had, but the brain works together in that way. When um, a trauma reaction occurs, the, the body senses danger. And when the body senses danger, it might go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. We've heard about fight and flight a lot in, in our culture, in psychology classes, um, but less about the freeze response. Um, and, but all three are part of our nervous system's emergency response. When our body senses danger, it takes an action. And sometimes, often actually, this action is not something that we choose con consciously. So it is a reactive response rather than an action. Wow. Let me tell you, everybody, you know, I say this quite often. Um, I 55 this year. I'm happy about that. But gosh, I love when I learn um, and at what age you can learn. And this is something I think we need to be talking about. We need to be talking. And by the way, I want people to understand as we're getting ready to take this break. Um, Trauma does not mean that you only experience that because you were in foster care. Correct. Um, you can have the most, quote, perfect parents and still have experienced trauma as a child. Is that right, Dr. Freeman? Yes. Yeah, there are lots of um, ways that, well, I mean, there are lots of different types of traumas, right? There are the traumas that everyone might agree um, are traumatic. Um, being taken from your family, right? Um, sexual assault, um, uh, a, a natural, you know, living through a natural disaster are some examples. And then there are other types of traumas uh, like, you know, being bullied repeatedly um, through a grade or throughout your childhood, um, being isolated, uh, uh, being targeted or humiliated in some way. Um, people are different, and sometimes those types of traumas, those those interpersonal traumas, can really live in someone's body um, much longer. Much longer. And can have you know the same degree of impact as sort of one of those you know bigger traumas that we that we might all agree are trauma. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break, but I want to talk about some of those traumas because there's some doors okay. that have opened up that I think that we need, and especially our listeners and our viewers need to understand because there's things that have happened in our lives within the last year, a year and a half, almost two years that I want to talk about how is that trauma, that pandemic trauma that we're hearing about is going to affect tomorrow. We'll be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that is inspiring our communities to bring dignity and hope to youth in foster care. You know, for just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Cases mission to eliminate trash bags from the foster care system. For every $10 donated, a Comfort XL duffel bag will be given to a child entering foster care. Please help us be part of the change. Go to comfortcases.org and see how you can help a child entering our foster care system. So um, I will have to tell you, this episode has really made me think. And not to say that because I'm talking to one of my good friends, Dr. Susie Friedman, um, about trauma, um, about stress and trauma. You know, um, my life is an open book. Um, I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book about the trauma that I received as a child, the trauma I received as a young adult. And even today, some of you have heard the story of the trauma that I'm trying to experience through one of our children with my husband and I. Um, but right now, you know, the pandemic has done a lot. It's done a lot for people in many different ways. And Dr. Friedman, before we had actually left for our um, break, we talked about the different levels of trauma and even you know some of the best parents, you know, kids come out of trauma for different things. And one of the things that you said is you said you can have trauma from nat natural disasters, okay? 
So a couple of things that I want to bring up where I want to know some definition. Number one, the pandemic. Number two, is a natu national disaster um, something that could tr have someone to have that type of trauma? And here's an example. You know, we did have um, this year, as horrifying it was, the collapse of an apartment building in the state of Florida. And I think a lot about friends of mine who live in high rises. And is that something that could be trauma induced? And now that is a trauma that they will continue to live with. I mean, that's a big question. And, and the, the most general answer to that is, I don't, I, I'm not sure because trauma is experienced, whether it's stress or trauma, it really is very individualized, both on the person's kind of natural, um, resilience level, um, as well as, you know, their history and kind of what they bring to the table and the ways in which they cope. Now, um, you know, that apartment building, I mean, that tragedy, um, those images are, you know, horrible for everyone and, and people might feel stressed um, and experience a lot of stress and whether it, but it could feel traumatizing um, for some people in, in the same way that 9-11 was a, a collective stressor or trauma for us here in the nation. Yeah. yeah. So what about the pandemic though? You know, I mean, do you feel that again, it's another one of those same situations that it was very stressful. I mean, I talk about it all the time that yeah. kids who come into foster care, they've been going through a pandemic, you know, for their whole life when they're in the system. Do you feel that that is again, one of those stressors and not as much as the, tr as the trauma? You know, um, it certainly is highly stressful for us. It has been highly stressful for all of us, but I to to know if it is traumatic. Um, again, you know, really individualized. You know, there may be some people who feel intensely isolated, or who have been intensely isolated during the pandemic and during quarantine, and and don't have usual supports, um, and that can feel it can feel traumatizing. It is, and and the thing that was interesting about the pandemic too is that some days felt really awful and then other days didn't and so it was really interesting the way um the weariness kind of waxed and waned for people um but it, again i think that is again one of those situations where um whether it feels traumatizing in the way that we've defined it here today um will depend on the individual again their history their their coping there's a support system and such. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to turn the wheels a little bit because you are a huge supporter of comfort cases, not only you, but your entire family. Um, and, you know, even your daughter has done some writing for us and you you have been such a huge ins inspiration. And I love the fact that you're getting ready to come on our board. Um, but I'd like to talk about some of the things, you know, when, we, when Reese and I started this organization almost nine years ago, by the way, um, and we were putting items in cases and thinking about the items, I will have to say we did not think about them in the approach that you think about them mm -hmm. when it comes to trauma. Okay. Yes. So I would love to talk about some of the items that we put in our case that reflects a trauma informed approach. Okay. So let's start, you know, immediately with the pajamas. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, so the, for me, the pajamas, you know, um, you talk about the comfort cases being to help foster dignity and worth, you know, for children entering the foster care system. And I think, you know, the pajama is, you know, an illustration of that. You know, if we, if we you know, think about um, attachment injury, um, or even before that, if we think about what children need, you know, children need reliability and stability. They need to know that they have worth um, they need to know um, that they're worthy of care and then they learn how to take care of themselves. So things like the pajamas, the dental kit, the toiletries, all of those to me feel like, uh, like we're communicating to the child, you, you, you're worth taking care of. 
you're worth taking care of yourself. Um, and so, and the, and also the fact that they are new, the pajamas, yeah. and that everything in the case, other than the book, sometimes is new. That the newness also communicates that for me. That you know, I love that. You know, I I've told you this story. You've read about it. You've heard me say it in so many speeches. You're yeah. you're one of the people that probably be next to Barry have heard me say more speeches than anyone. But I talk about the blanket, and I talk about my son Grayson, who at the age of six said, Daddy, we need to put a blankie in every case. And I said, a blankie? I said, you know, these kids aren't cold. And he said, I know, Daddy. But every time they wrap themselves up in their blankie, they know we love them. Yeah. So that's lovely, right? So it's like he's talking about swaddling in a way, right? You know? And I, you know, and I love that. I think that's so beautiful. I thought about it differently also in that um, when when there is a child that has chaos or disruption in their home or they're removed from their home, which is another layer of chaos. And then they're going to a, a place where they don't know anyone, another layer that they need, um, that I can't imagine what their little nervous system or their older nervous system feels like. You know, regardless of age, that has got to feel, you know, objectively very, very frightening. And then if you have a trauma history and things feel more dangerous for you anyway, that it must feel, I can't imagine, right? How unbearable that must feel. And so, so many strong feelings of different kinds. And for me, the blanket and the stuffed animal is about sort of soothing and comfort and, and being held, you know, like your son said, but also learning how to calm and hold yourself. Right. right, which is, you know, a, a skill that we need, each of us. So, you know, Dr. Freeman, as we're getting ready to end this session, I, I'd like to know, do you think we're doing it okay? I, you know, you know, the moment I heard about it, I had to be involved. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I love it. You know, I, the, you know, the book and the journal too, you know, other things that we need to be able to do is um, use or develop imagination. You know, if, you, if you're a traumatized um, person and your focus has been, will I be, you know, will I be safe? How will I be safe? Is, is, the, is, it, is there danger? Are these people okay? It, it doesn't leave a lot of time for thinking about what do I like? How do I use my imagination? And so having the coloring book, a journal, and the, and the book to read um, is really beautiful in that way because it's, it, it gives that space. You know, there's sort of mindfulness and kind of calming and relaxing activities that, that and, and skills, right, that you can develop from the coloring and the journaling, but the, also that piece about the imagination and developing, making space for imagination for kids who perhaps have not had that space before. Yeah. And, you know, I that's the one thing about the book for me. I talk about it quite often. You know, I remember, you know, as a boy, when I was homeless, I would go to the public library and I would sit in the cubicle and I would grab a book and I would fall into the pages. And I used to fall into the pages because, as you just said, my imagination, I was able to forget about all the pain that was around me and just be involved in that. And the crazy part, people ask me all the time, so what was that favorite book you read? And um, it was The Count to Monte Cristo. <laughs> and I know, can you believe that? And I remember that it was the Count of Monte Cristo. And I think it had so much to do with the intertwining of, you know, um, being someone who you weren't. And, you know, when, you know, the mask went on him and people didn't see. And, and it's still to this day, it is my my favorite book. Um, and so, you know, but I think about children when they're reading those books, how they're able to fall in. They're able to forget their surroundings, but also understanding, and you know this, you know, as a professor and as, you know, um, in teaching, you will know if we educate a child's mind, we can educate their future. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And, you know, what I was thinking as you were saying that you sort of were able to get lost in the book and forget about the pain for a little while, that that's, you're able to distract yourself by reading that book. And that is another skill that we all need, um, which is really, really hard to do when we have felt overwhelmed a lot, 
when we're afraid a lot and nobody's teaching us what that means. We have to be able to sort of put things aside and shift our focus in order to do something else. And so the book really, um, for me, is a trauma-informed item in that way as well. I love that. I love that. Well, listen, everyone, I told you um, fostering change is about educating, about making sure that we are living a better life than we let, was living yesterday. You know, Dr. Freeman has a shirt on, be a good human. She wears that shirt proudly. I know she does. Uh, if you would like, you can find her and her website, which is, Su and let me make sure I get this right, it's SusanFriedmanPhD.com. Um, you can also find her on Instagram at Dr. Susie. Um, you can actually go to our website because her picture will be there very soon. Um, listen, Susie, I am the luckiest guy in the world. And I say that because I get to call you my friend. And I get to, you are literally a phone call away from me. And I know that you have helped me through so many times and you still will. I love you. I love your family. And I want to thank you for all the love you have for so many people, because I think it's so important that we understand we must look at trauma differently than we had before. And I truly yeah. appreciate that. So, I'm so grateful to have been on today. Thanks so much for well, asking Thank you. And so listen, everyone, um, do what I always ask. Share. Share this episode. Um, like it. Um, you know, leave us a review. Anything that you want. If you have some questions for Dr. Susie Freeman, please email me at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. And I guarantee you that the doctor will answer them and then she will get back to you. Thank you everyone and have an amazing day. Bye-bye. Thanks again. I would like to thank all of you for listening to the Fostering Change podcast. You can subscribe on all of your favorite podcast streaming platforms, including Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Make sure you follow Comfort Cases on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at Comfort Cases. Check out the Fostering Change blog at comfortcases.org. And I know some of you have a question, and I know some of you would love to be a guest. Please personally reach out to me at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. That's fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Then do me a big favor, please, Help spread the word. Share this podcast. Share it with your friends and your family. Remember, I say this quite often, we're all part of the same community. And that community, it's not our zip code, but our human race. Let's all make a difference.